There have been 862 episodes of Doctor Who broadcast to date. My mission, for every single one, say something nice. We're starting in 1989, season 26. The first episode of the season, part one of Battlefield. Now this episode got Doctor Who's lowest ever ratings of 3.1 million people. And despite that, there is a lot to enjoy in this story, but the thing I'm going to pick out in particular for episode one is the casting of Angela Douglas as the Brigadier's wife, Doris. Doris had been previously referred to in Planet of the Spiders, but this is the first time we see her on screen, and having Angela Douglas there, look, I grew up not only as a Doctor Who fan, but as a Carry On fan, and Angela Douglas was in some of the early Carry On films, so it was quite a kick for me seeing her in Doctor Who. But also, she brings a sort of sensitivity to the role and a thoughtfulness, so that when the Brigadier is considering going off on a dangerous mission, Angela Douglas is able to express how Doris feels simply through facial expression and gesture. And I know people will say, yeah, well, that's acting, but that's the thing. She's given a limited amount of screen time in this episode and later on in the story, but mainly this one. And with that, she creates a believable, likeable character for whom we feel sympathy. And that's something nice about Battlefield Part 1. Hello everyone, today on Say Something Nice, we're looking at Battlefield Part 2. Battlefield just can't catch a break in the ratings. I mean, this one was slightly up with 3.9 million viewers. But yeah, you know, that lack of publicity really did not help this season. But something really nice about this episode is when the Brigadier and Morgane meet for the first time. And Morgane, who's the main villain of this story and a warrior queen, she wants a ceasefire to hold a memorial service for the war dead of Earth. And there's just this great couple of scenes between Nicholas Courtney and Jean Marsh where they're kind of both acknowledging each other as old soldiers who've seen more than their fair share of death. It's a strange, quiet moment, but it's something really nice about Battlefield Part 2. Hi everyone, today with 3.6 million viewers, it's Battlefield Part 3. Now, Battlefield got hit pretty hard in the ratings, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Doctor Who was still on opposite Coronation Street, and there was hardly any publicity for the new season, and this was the first story. However, Part 3 does see an iconic moment in Doctor Who, and that is when the Brigadier meets the Seventh Doctor for the first time. What I love about this is the Brigadier saves the Doctor's life, which is pretty much par for the course in their relationship, but what is so great about it is, when he helps the Doctor up off the ground, he just says, I can't let you out of my sight, can I, Doctor? The Brigadier just immediately knows if there's any strangely dressed man lying face down in a spaceship at the bottom of the lake, it's gonna be the Doctor. And these two just take off running together, Sylvester McCoy and Nicholas Courtney. But that scene is a delight, and it's something really nice about Battlefield Part 3. Hi everyone, as we come to the end of another week of Say Something Nice, we of course come back to Battlefield <laughs> Part 4 today. With 4 million viewers, this is the highest rating episode of Battlefield Part 4. And you know what, while it's tempting to say another thing connected with the brig, Instead, I'm going to single out the design of the Destroyer. Now, he doesn't get much to do in the story, but the mask is an amazing piece of animatronics with Marek Anton's real eyes looking out at you. And of course, Marek Anton himself is a very physically imposing man, as I'm sure many Doctor Who fans have noticed over the years. But it gives this monster such presence. And in a story that deals quite unambiguously with the idea of magic, you need a concrete threat in the form of the monster. And the Destroyer is such an amazing design that it really delivers. And that's something nice about Battlefield Part 4. Hello dear viewers and welcome back to a very special episode of Say Something Nice. It's special because I accidentally skipped a line in my spreadsheet and forgot to do Ghostlight Part 1. Ghostlight Part 1, in common with the Smugglers and Curse of Fenric episodes from last week, got 4.2 million viewers. And I'm choosing a moment from this episode that's quite early on. It's when the Doctor and Ace first arrive at Gabriel Chase, and the Doctor sends Ace out ahead of him from the TARDIS. The reason I like this so much is that Sylvester McCoy's interpretation of the character 
was someone who enabled others to find their own intelligence. So his idea with the Doctor and Ace's relationship was that the Doctor would be teaching Ace about the universe, not just instructing her or lecturing her, but encouraging her to go out and make her own deductions. And that is what this scene is in summary. The Doctor sends Ace out on an initiative test and she reports back to him what she sees and what she interprets based on that. It's a great example of something that is in the concept of the characters actually being put into script form in a way that advances the plot as well. And Sophie is absolutely charming in this scene and it goes to show her power as an actress that Ace is so different from who we saw first in Dragonfire, but is still undeniably the same character with the same curiosity and desire to poke things with a stick and see what happens. And that's something really nice about Ghostlight Part 1. Welcome back everyone for another week of Say Something Nice. Today we're still in 1989 for Ghostlight Part 2. Ghostlight Part 2 got 4 million viewers in common with every episode we'll be covering this week. And today I want to highlight a performance, that of Frank Windsor as Inspector Mackenzie. Now, in the story, Inspector Mackenzie is a police officer who's been dispatched to the House Gabriel Chase to investigate the disappearance of some of the occupants. However, he's put in stasis and put in a drawer for several years until the doctor wakes him up. And what I love about Inspector McKenzie is no matter how strange things get around him, he finds ways to rationalise them. But in a way, his rationalisations are more strange than the actual reality of the situation. Now, despite the fact he's a bit of a foolish character, he still gets moments of intelligence and heroism, which to me is a sign of well-rounded writing. And he just seems to be trying to make Sylvester McCoy laugh in their scenes together. But Sylv just has a twinkle in his eye and bounces off him, which is fantastic. And there's a nice little character touch that he's just eating in almost every scene he's in. And I believe the logic the actor presented for this was, well, if he's been asleep for two years, he's, you know, gonna have a bit of a feed. He's gonna break his fast. And I love the idea that the actor just wanted to get a free feed. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I hear. That's why Frank Windsor is something nice about Ghostlight Part 2. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming back for another week of Say Something Nice. Today, we're still in Season 26, it's Ghostlight Part 3. This episode got 4 million viewers, and one of my favourite moments in it comes from the very top of the episode. Pretty much, in order to explain the cliffhanger, the Doctor and Ace do this massive info dump to Inspector Mackenzie. And what I really love about it is, despite the fact that it's the Doctor and Ace explaining everything that's going on, and as I say, it's an info dump, it's funny, it's cogent, and it doesn't feel like you're being bombarded with information. A lot of people describe this story as Doctor Who for the video age. This is when fans were regularly recording the program in their homes and then rewinding it and watching it again and again and again. And Ghostlight is one of those stories that benefits from multiple rewatches. But if you pay close attention to this explanation at the top of part three, you really do get the story. But of course, Inspector McKenzie is kind of baffled. As I said last week, he's not a stupid character by any means, but he is a bit out of his depth here. But to top it all off, when he then asks the Doctor and Ace, who are you two? <laughs> they just say, oh, we, we wouldn't want to confuse you. And it's beautifully underplayed. It's poking fun without ridiculing the character of McKenzie. And it kind of just signs off this little info dump and then we're back to the plot. And it's all over in 10 or 15 seconds, I think. And that's something really nice about Ghostlight Part 3. Thank you for watching and I'll see you tomorrow. Hello dear viewers and welcome back to Say Something Nice. And do you want to know something? It's going to be a bittersweet day when we run out of Sylvester McCoy episodes because I love the Sylvera. And it breaks my heart that we're covering so many of them. And today is no exception. It's The Curse of Fenric, part one. Today, I'm just picking a small scene from this episode, which is when Ace befriends Jean and Phyllis, two young evacuees from London who've been sent to the Northumberland coast 
to escape the Blitz in World War II. What I like about this, and it's something that the production team of this time do quite often with Sophie Aldred as Ace, is that they allow her character to get to know young people around her own age. As part of the story, we had Xiao Yong in Battlefield, we had Susan Q in The Happiness Patrol, and here we have Jean and Phyllis. While this relationship may not be as strong, or spoiler alert, long-lasting as some of the friendships Ace makes across the course of the series, it's very sweet that these three young women who are separated by 40 years of culture can still become fast friends have little jokes with each other in just a short period of time. What it means as the story goes on is it gives us a greater emotional connection with Jean and Phyllis to help us care about what happens to them through the story. And it all starts with just that little scene in front of the church. And that's something really nice about The Curse of Fenric, part one. Hello everyone, today on Say Something Nice we're continuing with The Curse of Fenric, part two. The Curse of Fenric is one of those rare stories which balances its action moments and its character moments really well. And the moment I've chosen from this episode is a character moment, and it's the conversation between Ace and the Reverend Wainwright when she finds him in the church, and he is having a crisis of faith. We later find out that the Reverend is starting to lose his faith because he can't reconcile the morality of British bombs being dropped on German cities and killing German children and he wonders if the whole world is going to be destroyed by this war. And Ace just tells him to have faith in her. Now, she doesn't tell him about the future. She doesn't tell him that she's from a Britain in the future where there is peace with Germany. Instead, she just sits with him and comforts him. It's a really mature moment, and it shows how far the character of Ace has come. There is no judgment in her in this moment. There is only compassion and sympathy. And that's something really nice about The Curse of Fenric, Part 2. The Curse of Fenric, Part 3. Much like Battlefield, The Curse of Fenric had a lot of material cut out of it to make its broadcast time slot. There have been numerous extended editions over the years, but one scene that's common to all of them and is in Part 3 of the broadcast version is the scene where the Hemovores attack the church and the Doctor has to repel them using faith. Now, I know this is a scene that a lot of people are going to point to from this episode, and depending on the version of the story you watch, in the sound mix, it's more or less obvious what's happening. But what I love about this episode is when the Doctor has to call upon something he has faith in, he lists companions under his breath. It's really great. Some of the names are from the 60s, some are from the 70s, some are from more recent companions as well. And it's great that no attention is drawn to it. No one says to the Doctor, who were those names you were saying? So it's something we, as longtime fans, know. And for a more casual viewer, who may have only come to Doctor Who with Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred, they're wondering, oh, what, what was that he was saying? It's one of those continuity nods that only adds things, but doesn't alienate people who don't understand what those words mean. And that's something really nice about The Curse of Fenric Part 3. The Curse of Fenric Part 4. Now the moment I'm going to choose from this episode, it's probably really obvious to everyone out there, but it's the moment where Vershinin and Captain Bates choose to help one another rather than continue fighting each other. This whole situation has been engineered by Fenric to pit humanity against itself to the point where it destroys itself on a massive planetary scale. But this argument is also being carried out in very small ways, just between people. And Bates and Vashinen agree to help each other rather than just attack each other because they're on opposite sides. It's showing that not only can the Doctor and Ace prevent Fenric from destroying the world, but humanity itself, just in small ways, can resist his influence as well. It doesn't hurt that the soldiers look like they do anyway, but the spirit of human triumph over evil is something really nice about The Curse of Fenric Part 4. I'll see you tomorrow. Stefan Rimkus, Marikanton, just saying. Hello dear viewers and welcome back to another episode of Say Something Nice. We're sticking with the Sylvester McCoy era for Survival Part 1. With 5 million viewers, this was the first episode of the last Doctor Who story. And I think it's possibly the most successful all-location 
Doctor Who story as the Doctor and Ace run around the streets of Perivale, but also the planet of the Cheetah People. But getting ahead of myself there because we barely see the planet of the Cheetah People in this episode, I am choosing for this episode, my nice thing, is the appearance of Hale and Pace. Now, as a kid, I grew up watching Hale and Pace's sketch comedy show, which is what they were really famous for. Now, they're brought into Doctor Who as two men who run a corner shop. With some of JNT's stunt casting, he would cast people to their strengths, he'd cast comedians to play comedic roles, but in this case, he's cast comedians to play just everyday roles. But Hale and Pace find the comedy in the lines. I really enjoy their banter and them not quite understanding each other's jokes as well. Apparently they swapped roles shortly before filming and I wonder if that was an effort to keep the script fresh for them because of course freshness is a big part of comedy. If you over rehearse something comedic you lose some of the spontaneity in there. I also think it's a really successful piece of casting because if you don't know who they are, I don't feel the casting is distracting. The story doesn't invite a massive amount of attention to the fact that we've got Hale and Pace. If you're not familiar with their other work, they're just two actors playing these roles. And they're only in this episode, they don't play a big role in the plot. There is an upsetting scene that sort of writes them out if you are a lover of cats, but until then, they're quite funny without subverting the seriousness of the story. And their performances are something really nice about Survival Part 1. Hello dear viewers and welcome back to another week of Say Something Nice. It's a week full of Scottish doctors, but we're starting off with Survival Part 2. This episode got 4.8 million viewers and it is part of the last ever Doctor Who story. The moment I'm choosing from this episode is when the Doctor and Patterson are on the planet of the Cheetah People, riding along on a horse together, and the Doctor explains to Patterson where they are and what is happening. As opposed to Ghostlight, where I also chose another explanation scene, this one is a bit slower. It's easier to absorb the information. And the funny thing is, despite the fact it's easier to absorb the information, Patterson still really doesn't quite get it. He's in constant denial throughout this story as to what is happening around him. And the Doctor just has this kind of air of disdain. Like he's, yeah, I'm going to explain to you what's happening but I know you're not going to listen. <laughs> but the Doctor gives him a chance to listen and to understand, and despite all that, <laughs> still works to protect Patterson, make sure he's okay, even though Patterson has his big bravado, like he's absolutely fine. Uh, it's just a really nice moment. It's a good moment for this Doctor's character. I'm reading the New Adventures novels at the moment, and sometimes this Doctor, in those books, gets a bit too mean, a bit too nasty, a bit too mercenary. Here, you sense his frustration in having to deal with Patterson, but you're left with no doubt that the Doctor will still work to protect him and get him home. And that's something really nice about Survival Part 2. Hello dear viewers and welcome back to another episode of Say Something Nice. And today is sort of an ending. Um, no, this series is an ending. This series has about 800 more episodes to go. But we are talking about Survival Part 3. Survival Part 3, the last episode of Classic Doctor Who, got 5 million viewers. And what I find so nice about this episode is it's all about tying up the story, but not doing it in a really rushed way. It's about the people and the characters that we've come to know over this story. And Russell T Davies has said many times that so much of the DNA of his Doctor Who had its foundations laid towards the end of the Sylvester McCoy era, and we really get that here. We're introduced to a bunch of supporting characters in this story, such as Midge, Shreela, Derek, Sergeant Patterson, and this episode gives us endings for each of them. Derek and Shreela, of course, depart very early on in this episode to go home, but there is that beautiful moment from Derek where he is just so happy to be home that he almost deliriously thanks the Doctor. Shreela, of course, 
says a very quick and quiet goodbye to Ace. And it's not so much lots of big thank you. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm home. It's just, I must get home. I must see my family. I must check how they're doing. Patterson, of course, is in complete denial about what is going on. And that leads to his demise. But even that is sort of paid tribute to by the fact that the Doctor and Ace try to save him and the sorrow on the Doctor's face that this bloviating idiot has been killed. His death is still mourned and noted. And of course, Midge's death is contrasted with Kara's. Midge is killed in the service of the Master and the Master just basically walks up to him and says, ah, well, you failed, time to die. When Kara is killed, Ace is distraught and mourns her death and sits with the body. And it contrasts the responses of the Master and Ace, both of whom have been infected with the cheetah virus, but it makes it clear that it's not the cheetah virus that decides who is more humane and who is more animalistic. It's their actions and their personalities. Now, of course, there is that beautiful speech at the end, but so much has been said about that over the years that I can't add anything meaningful to it beyond the fact that it still brings a tear to my eye to this day, both because it's beautiful in and of itself, but it tells us how much we were robbed in not seeing more of this type of Doctor Who because they really had got it right by this stage. And I would also like to give an honourable mention to Anthony Ainley as the Master. This is his last televised Doctor Who story. He did return to provide cutscenes for the video game Destiny of the Doctors. He did famously decline to return to the role for Big Finish, which of course left it open for Jeffrey Beavers, who has done amazing work as the crispy master, as people like to call him. But really, this is the curtain call for Anthony Ainley, who was so very proud of the role. He absolutely loved playing the master. You know, several people involved with the show have said Anthony Ainley lived for two things. He lived for cricket and he lived for playing the master. And this is one of his finest performances in the role. And uh, yeah, I think he's been gone about 16 years now. I think he passed away in 2004. And I think if he was still with us today, he would be chuffed that people are still discovering his performances as the master. So thank you very much, Anthony Anley. Thank you, Sylv. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Rona Munro for this amazing Doctor Who script. And just the fact that Doctor Who went out on such a high and on an episode that really cares about the people within it is something really nice about Survival Part 3. As always, thank you at home so much for watching. Do keep yourselves safe, wash your hands, and I will see you in the next video.